for you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's just guessing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what about you all? But all I saw that in part, it's like, thanks for playing. <laughs> yeah. thanks. I feel so tall right now. Yeah. <laughs> well, good morning. How is everybody this morning? <laughs> We're so happy to have everybody here, including Mark will be bringing us the message, hence, so he can <laughs> sit. Um, we don't want him standing on that knee just yet. Not for that long. Especially when he likes to do this. Dance around up here. I'd be doing this. Yeah, we don't want to do that. No. Well, if you're watching us online, we want to welcome you as well. Please give us a shout out in the comments and just tell us, uh, let us know that you're there. Uh, we're happy to have you join us this morning. So... This past Wednesday night, we kicked off our uh, seven words Bible study, and today we're kicking off the sermon series. So, uh, mm -hmm. this is um, well, we don't naturally try to avoid Jesus and the cross. I mean, we like to gravitate towards Christmas and his birth and all the, the nice, fun stuff, right? So, we don't necessarily want to get away from the reality of the cross, but the reality is Jesus went to the cross. And it's from that cross that he speaks to us and he shows us his deepest love. It's from that cross that Jesus' full humanity draws us closest to him. It's from that cross as Jesus breathes his last breath and speaks his last words that his deep trust in the Father and his divine glory are revealed. We're going to be going through Jesus' seven last words over the next six weeks. So there's going to be a little overlap there, but if you're, doing the, if you're trying to do the math, it is not new math. It's just the, the way that that worked out. But we are going to be exploring those seven last words on the cross through a lens that finds life for us, finds hope for us. And as we always do, it will have a biblical perspective the study and the sermon series will bring a hopeful and contemplative take on the cross during the following weeks of Lent. Now this Wednesday, we kick off Lent. And so we will be having an Ash Wednesday service on Wednesday night. We will have the, the position of the ashes as we have in the past. And Mark had put a, a slide up here that tells us what, or explains it in a quote as to what Lent is. <laughs> if you can't hear the sermon, would that be person? Possibly, yeah. Technical difficulties. Mm -hmm. Tell her, I'll check it in a moment. It is Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> there we go. We took a technical timeout. There we go. There we go. So, John Chittister said this, Lent is a call to renew a commitment grown dull, perhaps by a life more marked by routine than reflection. We often will not say it in these words, but in different words when we are talking about taking communion. How it's not just something that we do, and it's just something that we should be dull to. It's something that marks what Christ did on the cross for us. And so with Lent on Wednesday, starting with Ash Wednesday, we will be have taking a reflective view of what goes on. Then we're going to fast forward to March, and in March on the second, we'll be going to the Iron Sharpens Iron Conference. If you haven't signed up and you want to go, the sign up is on the back table. And then uh, we will have a wonderful day of fellowshipping and worshiping and just being sharpened by other men. Following that, the following weekend on March 9th, we will have number two of our Orange Track Racing Season. 19. So we're looking forward to doing that and uh, we'll have that. Yesterday was busy. We had a bunch, we had, we only had 16 physical people in, in here, but of those we had an additional six racers who 
people brought their cars for them and staged them up. And so we had a full boat. It was, I think Diane said, longer than any of the races last year, except for finals. Uh, so uh, it was a great time and we had a lot of fun. So if you know somebody who might be interested, would love to have some fun, uh, have them join us. And then uh, following up with that, I think we decided on the 16th, I had to look for confirmation. We will update the date on here and it won't be read on the trailer later, so forgive us for that. But we'll be uh, watching the movie Finding Normal and uh, this stars Candace Cameron Bure. This is uh, after Full House and before Fuller House. <laughs> and while she was doing some Hallmark Channel stuff and, and uh, she plays Dr. Lisa Leland. And she is driving from the West Coast to the East Coast, Northeast, to uh, start up a clinic with her boyfriend. Not fiance, just boyfriend. <coughs> and then she gets pulled over in the tiny town of Normal, North Carolina, and cited, and has to do community service because her credit card doesn't work, her phone doesn't work, she's out in the middle of nowhere in the early 2000s. And uh, so she has to put in 16 hours of community service as the town doctor, because the town doctor is ill. And she will get a whole new uh, perspective of what normal is. So we invite you to join us for that. Today's worship will be posted up in the comments of the, the live feed, so uh, please click on that link so that you can worship with us in music after the fact. So with that being said, let's go to our call to worship this morning. This comes from Luke 6.27, the New King James Version. It says, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. Interesting words as we go through that. It's a little bit different take on that, but it's not just who curse at you and hate you, but who spitefully use you. The Jews, well, they despised the Romans because of their oppression. Think Romans, Egyptians, they didn't like either one. In the time of the Egyptians, the loss or the, there was hatred enemy. But this is where Jesus takes it another step. He fills in the gaps as he has, does throughout the Gospels. The love Jesus has for us is our call. And in order to love our enemies, to pray for those who persecute us, to pray for those who spitefully use us, we have to make a conscious effort. We, it's, not like love, it's not like a love between a husband and wife. When they first meet, they fall in love, fall in. It's a conscious decision, a conscious effort. That's what keeps husbands and wives together after the fact, but it's a conscious decision to love. And we as Christ followers have much different values than the world does. And if we, if you don't, let me put it that way, you should. Those values must, not need, must be distinguishable from the rest of the world. So when we go out into the world, they need to see Christ in us, not see the world in us, because that's what turns people against Christianity. The world wants to detract us from those values, and they're going to use everything possible. A few weeks ago we talked about the, the demon com conference, right? Everything you could think of to detract us from our values. All manner of things used. Trying to pull us from the love that Jesus has for us. Now, if we can be forgiven by a loving God, <coughs> we have to forgive as well. We need to let the knowledge of God's love and Jesus be our guide. And on Wednesday night as we were talking about the, this topic and Father forgive them and this came up 
And it's from Romans 12, it's verse 14. It says, bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. And here's the important part with the forgiveness. Pray that God will bless them. Now, how hard is that? You can easily say, oh, I forgive them. But are you willing to pray that God will bless them? Father, as we prepare to hear the message that you prepared and gave to Mark for today, we thank you. We thank you that through your forgiveness, we are made righteous in your eyes. That through your forgiveness, we can have eternal life. Father, just help us to hear this message. Help us to understand what it means to forgive others. And not just forgive them, but to bless them. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. That's the hardest part, is getting up out of the chairs, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you guys don't mind, I'm going to sit for this today. Mm -hmm. uh, it's truly a pleasure to be back here. Uh, one month ago today, at about this time, I was laying in the operating room. So, God is good. It's great to be back. So as we look at this, I kind of want to go back on our call to worship this morning. And... When we look at that call to worship, uh, Pastor Terry talked about this last week, and, and he talked about the difference between hearing and listening. And so Lori's been through it before, because she used to, she went through my classes, my business classes I taught. And the human ear has the ability to hear over 600 sounds individually at any one given point in time. But see, we really don't cognitively assess what is being heard until we focus on any one given part of it. That's called listening, when we cognitively focus on what is being said or heard. And so that then brings it into our conscious state and allows us to process it. And so there's, there's I won't go in through the whole thing, but this verse today is talking about that. But I say to you who hear, Meaning, those who hear my voice and recognize my voice. You're going to see that in the scripture a lot. But for those who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. And bless those who, are, who curse you. And pray for those who spitefully use you. So, when we think about this, and, and this is the, we're, we're kicking off the Lenten season. And the Lenten season is a time of renewal. It's a time for us to look outside the box. As I said last year, it's a time for us to look outside the box to help others then to restore their lives by the good graces that God has given you, that he's blessed you with. And so as we come into this time of Lent, it's a great reminder of the verse in Lamentations that tells us that uh, God's mercies are new each and every morning for us. And if we look past that every morning as we get out of bed, and, uh, you know, hopefully you'll take this the correct way. Uh, a lot of us get out of bed and say, you oh, good God, morning. Instead of saying, good God, it's morning. Thank you, God. And looking at the mercies that he has for us that day. Everything is a new start each and every day. And if we look at it, and if we listen to God's word, and we listen to what is being said, then we have a great start to the day. And so we have to look at everything in the correct frame of mind. And as we hear this, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. Now the words of Christ in here at this point in time are very important because uh, Jesus was not just someone else who died on the cross as a martyr. Um, he died to bring salvation to all. But what he did on that cross, when he was going to the cross, all the things that led up to the cross, see, without that resurrection that he had, without taking on all that punishment, without doing all the things that he did, see, there would be no salvation for us. If he was just someone else who died on the cross, 
then salvation would never exist. But he wasn't. And if it wasn't, it was God doing out of love for the people, the very people who spiced, despised him. And, him. and we'll go into that here in a minute. So as we enter into the, the season of Lent this week, Lent begins on Ash Wednesday, and this year it's February 14th, which is also Valentine's Day, right? Now, Ash Wednesday is kind of a somber time. <laughs> you don't really think about love. But I want you to think about this, and that's kind of why I use that call to worship today, is because it's a time for us to be in a time of reflection. It's a time for us to look at our own mortality. We're not going to be around forever. So if you haven't made a decision by now to follow God in Christ Jesus, you need to get on the stick. So it's, it's kind of a reflection of those times. It's a 40 days of Lent, then pay homage to the 40 days that Jesus spent in the wilderness to fast, to pray, to endure the temptations of the devil, all in preparation for that public ministry that he had, which would culminate in his death on the cross. And in Lent, those who have been baptized are called to renew their baptismal commitment. And that's why I use that slide up there, uh, that commitment that we made that, that has kind of dulls down over time. It's to remind us of that commitment that we made a long time ago. And for those, it's also a period uh, of people being able to come into baptism who have discerned that it is their aim in life and to become Christians and to actually make that commitment through. So it kind of has a duality in it that uh, Lent is, is a time of reflection, of redemption, of restoration. There we go. A little too cramped up. <laughs> and it's a time of renewal. And we need to understand that this whole Lenten season um, is that time of spiritual preparation for Easter, for that resurrection, for Christ rising from the dead. Just as Advent is for Christmas, Jesus taught us clearly that there is no resurrection without the cross. No other religion has this, period, in the entire world. They don't have that hope. They don't have that promise. We are the only ones as Christians that have that promise of a hope for the future a life of eternity with Christ, with God. And Lent is the church's greatest spiritual journey. And, and in the uh, context that I was picking this from, it says that Lent is the church's greatest spiritual journey as she, the bride of Christ, joins her divine spouse in his great suffering on our behalf. Now, when you use that, it's really theological in nature and everything, talking about the Bride of Christ, which is our church, that's who we are, um, and then the divine spouse being God in Jesus. And But what does all that mean? Well, basically, it all boils down to you don't get the joy of Easter, of Christ rising from the dead. You don't get that joy without the self-sacrifice of Lent. We need to have that time of spiritual preparation to get us in the right frame of mind, to get us in the right mood, and to get us in that right relationship with God to understand what the resurrection really means. What does Easter really represent for us? And if we don't do that preparation ahead of time, it then becomes kind of a dull routine thing that we go through. So it's a really kind of a neat time for us in the life of the church to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. And this study that we're doing uh, on the seven words, um, you're going to see that we're going to look at all of the different things that led up to the cross and why the cross and why this is important. Um, and it even includes the bloody ones, the things that we don't really want to face up to or we don't want to look at, you know, we don't want to really admit, but that's all part of what happened and had to happen in order for us to have restoration a restoration with God, a renewal of who we are, and to have a resurrection, salvation as our promise. So we observe land in the traditional sense that we come before God and confess our sins and the repentance of those sins. But see, that's just a small part of it. That just is that preparation getting us 
ready for that resurrection. So during the period, we're called to reflect on our own mortality. We're only here for a little while. Time to get with the program. If you haven't made your uh, self right with God and have a good relationship with God, then now's the time, you know? Now's the time. Um, so if we don't have a relationship with the living God in Jesus Christ, and then to go beyond that and thank God for everything that he has given us to this time. Sometimes, you know, we, we kind of run right past that part. And we forget to, we're, we're so busy wanting to present a list to God of the stuff we want and the stuff we think we need that we completely forget to thank God for all of the things he gives us without us asking. So most Christians during the time of Lent will self-sacrifice into, into a period of fasting. And, and uh, to be fair, when most think of fasting, they're thinking of, okay, I gotta give up eating for 40 days. And that's just simply not true. Uh, it's a period of fasting, meaning we're, we are called to observe a period of self-denial, a giving up of a, of a luxury indulgence or something like that for the 40 days. And if you think about it, some people give up chocolate or alcohol or smoking or you know, just simply eating less during that period lessening ourselves before God. So we're paying homage to that 40 days that Jesus spent in fasting in the desert. So in the traditional form, then we end that fasting period, that end of that 40 days, by having a breaking of the fast. Now, a lot of people now know that as breakfast, but that is where that came from. They are breaking the fast that you had for those 40 days. And communally, normally you do that by having like an Easter morning breakfast to celebrate then the risen Christ. And so it's, it's both a reflection time, it's a renewal time, and it allows us then to celebrate having a Savior in Jesus Christ. So the name of this message today is Father, Forgive Them. And when we look at that, and, and for those of you who were here Wednesday, uh, you heard me explain part of this already. Um, but it's ten words that change the course of mankind for all time. Have you ever thought about it that way? Those ten words, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That changed the course for all of mankind, for all time. Pretty powerful words, ten words. Today I want to delve into what it really means and what it really says. And I think that most of us have heard this every year, pretty much, for our entire lives, but may not understand all the ramifications of what Father forgive them, for they know not what they do. Uh, if we look into the Greek translation, they use the form of the verb that says, he prayed this prayer many times over while on the cross. It wasn't just once, but he repeated it many times. See, that tells us that he was calling out to God in prayer, because this is prayer. He's calling out to God, and he's pleading for us, for our forgiveness. Love to the very end. What else would you call it? Love to the very end. See, love brought him to us. Love brought him to us. Love kept him with us. Love held him on the cross. It wasn't the nails. It wasn't the lashings. It was love. Love took him to the cross. Love kept him on the cross. And love then brought us salvation, renewal, refreshing. It was done out of love. He was the absolute embodiment. Embodiment in the flesh of God's love for the world that he created for us. So he was in the he, he, he was on the cross. He he had just been through this complete process of being brutalized in the most heinous ways. He was crucified. You know they, they came up with a, a new word which I think I told you about before. They came up with a new word just to describe how bad it felt 
to be on that cross. Excruciating pain came from that exact term, being crucified, excruciating pain. It was horrid pain. Nails driven through his leg bones, nails driven through his hands, hands lashed to the cross and hung to die. And yet, while he's on that cross, while he is enduring that excruciating pain, he showed love. He showed love. He prayed for us. But see, that's only part of it. So let's go back and, and kind of build the bigger picture today. See, all of the people on his way there, what happened to him? Well, he was unjustly put on trial, falsely accused, spat on, beaten, had a crown made of thorns put on his head, pain driven into him. He was scourged, beat to the point of death, and yet he prayed, and yet he went to the cross. He could have called down 10,000 angels to save him. But see, that wasn't what God's will was. And he fulfilled God's will. John 1 starts telling us about how it all began. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. And the Word was with God. He was in the beginning with, all, with God, and all things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. That means that he was in everything. In everything that God created, he was in. Jesus was in that the whole time. He was the Word of God. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. See, here we see that Jesus was here from the very beginning and had always existed with God. He was our salvation from the very beginning throughout the ages. Through all, all time that had passed until God's time was right and was correct. And then he sent Jesus to be with us in the flesh. Because, see, we as men, women, I use men as the conjunctive form, we didn't get it. <laughs> no matter what God did and said and who he sent to us, we just didn't get it must be pretty thick. So John goes on to tell us here that he was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own didn't receive him, but as many times as those who had received him, he gave them then the right to become children of God. And that goes back to what Pastor Terry was talking about last week. The words were being spoken, but only certain people were hearing. Only certain people were cognitively focusing on what was being said. And to those people then who received the word and accepted the word of God, accepted the word of Christ, he gave them the right to become children of God. To those who believed in his name, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of the will of God. Jesus was born not of the flesh. He became flesh through the will of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as old of the begotten Father, because no one can look upon the face of God and live. So God sent us Jesus so that we could see the embodiment of God and his love for us from the very beginning. And Jesus was born then sinless because he was not born of the flesh. He was born of God and not from man. And so that made him sinless from the very beginning. He came freely and openly to the very people he created, and they did not receive him. They didn't receive his gift of grace and salvation, so he dwelt among them, teaching the will of God, how to be the people of God. And some heard and accepted. But others were afraid to him. They were blind to what he was and who he was. In the quiz this morning, it was kind of fun. Uh, it, it talked about the Sadducees, you know. And I always loved it. I always made a joke of it. They were Sadducees because they didn't know Christ. <laughs> That's what's, well, 
All right, anyway. I digress. Um, but see, they were jealous of him. And the Pharisees were afraid of him. And they turned against him because, not that he wasn't speaking the will of God, not that he wasn't speaking the word of God. He was the embodiment of God in their midst, but see, it threatened their very way of life. The stranglehold that they had for thousands of years over the Jewish people. And see, the Jewish people had the enemies. And we think of people that we don't like today. We don't really think of, you know, you're my mortal enemy over here. And, you know, the, the thing they do is, is go out and kill you. Um, some people have that mindset. Not many, thank God. Uh, that we have changed our ways over the years. But in those days, we had the enemies. So the Jews and the Gentiles were enemies. They didn't associate with each other. They didn't blend together. See, but the th truth of the matter is, they were all children of God. They were all born of God. And truthfully, they're all one family under God. And until they come to that realization, they will never see God in the flesh. So some heard and accept, but others were afraid of him and were blind to who he was. He performed many great signs and wonders before their very eyes, and they believed, and yet some still turned away from him. Even the ones that were raised up out of the people to be scholars of God would not let go of the doubt, even though he taught in the very temples built to bring honor and glory to God. But see, those temples had just become a monument to men not to God. They went through all the rites and rituals and everything that was called out in the laws of Moses, but they got so caught up in the law, the law became their God. The law became their God. They were living to fulfill the law of Moses and would pass judgment on anyone who would stray from the law imposed upon them. Now they had over 630 laws that they had to, uh, that were written laws, and they had over a thousand laws, which were unwritten laws, that the Pharisees would impose upon the people. This kept the, kept the people in a stranglehold. They thought that they were imprisoned and that they were subjecticated into by the Romans. What about the Pharisees? They never could escape that. So by their own people, the people who were supposed to be the representatives of God, were actually subjugating the people of God for their own good, for their own purposes. Jesus was the fulfillment of the law in their very midst, and yet they were blind to who he was. The very ones who should have embraced him in, in open arms looked at him as a threat to their very existence. These were the men of God, the priests in the temple. They looked on Jesus, God in the flesh, as a threat to their very existence. John tells us in chapter 3, 16 through 21, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, will have eternal life. God sent his Son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only Son. Wow. Think about that. So, it goes on to say that those who do what is right come to the light so others can see what they are doing, what God wants. And see, that's one of the portions that, for some odd reason, uh, keeps getting left out keeps getting left out. God's light came into the world, but the people loved darkness more than light, for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right come to the light so others can see what they are doing, what God wants. And see, that's where the Sadducees and the Pharisees were trapped. Because they were doing evil. They were subjugating the Jewish people. Instead of giving them the freedom that God has expressed to them, 
They were taking away those freedoms and subjugating them to the law, imprisoning them to the law. Jesus came to the world to save the world through him. His messages were teaching of how godly people ought to behave and how to turn away from the world and return to God. They were messages of repentance, of salvation, of renewal. Hey, any of this sound familiar? It's like Lent, living it out day after day after day. And so Jesus was bringing this, this hope, this good news, repentance, renewal, right relationship with God. There were messages of hope, redemption, joy, peace, love. Some heard his voice and were saved. Others saw his signs and wonders and believed and followed him. But those who did not turn away from the word, those who didn't turn away from the world, I'm sorry, turned against him. In doing so, they fulfilled the prophecies that had been foretold hundreds of years before. In all, there were over 300 prophecies of the Old Testament that were fulfilled in the life and death of Jesus. The prophet Isaiah wrote about Jesus 670 years before his birth and foretold how he would be received. He told them, God gave him the vision, and he said he was trying to tell his people, hey, be on the lookout for this. This is what's coming. Isaiah said that there was nothing beautiful nor majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But see, he was pierced for our rebellion crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid upon him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, and yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as sheep is silent before the shears, he did not open his mouth and unjustly condemned, he was led away. Here's the most important part. And yet he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Understand, Jesus knew what laid before him. He knew his lot in life. He knew from the very beginning what was going to happen. He knew all that he had to endure. He had to take it all in. He had to take all of that upon himself. What he had to give us to make us whole in the sight of God. He had to take on all of that. Punishment, sins, grief, rejection. All of those things. And yet he prayed for us. And yet he preached forgiveness. And yet in spite of all these things, he... He preached repentance. He preached grace, peace, love, salvation to the very ones who brought the suffering to him. The very ones who brought suffering to him. See, he never turned away from what the future held for him. He continued to bring hope to the lost. Heal those who believed and brought wholeness to those who were cast aside in the world. But he also brought a warning to those who would not believe at the same time. Those who turned against him despite knowing who he was. So in Luke, he tells us in Luke 23, 27 to 39, and a great multitude of the people followed him, and the women who also mourned and lamented him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, no, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren wombs that never bore, and the breasts which never nursed. And they would begin to say that the mountains fall on us, and to the hills cover us. For if they do these things in 
Greenwood what will be done in the dry. There are also there are two others, criminals led with him to be put to death. And then when they had come to the place called Calvary, to the place they called the skull, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. And the people stood looking on, but even the rulers with them sneered, saying, Well, he saved others, let him save himself. If he is the Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering sour wine and saying, If you are the king of Jews, save yourself. And an inscription was also written over him in the letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals who were hanged, blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And yet we indeed justly receive the due reward for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he prayed for them. He prayed to God. Father, forgive them, for they know about what they do. He was praying a prayer for those there with him that day. He prayed for the very people who turned against him, to sentence him to death. He was praying for those yet to come, you and I. What he prayed, Father, forgive them. See, that's us. That's us. Every time we sin, Every time we turn away from God, every time we find an excuse not to answer the call of God in our lives, every time we fail to be the hands and feet of God, that's us. That's us. Father, forgive them. That's us. See, that's us every time we fail God. And that's Him praying for us every time. Father, forgive us today for not following you and what we say and do. Father, forgive us when we turn away from your teachings and stray away. Forgive us. Every time we neglect to give others a hand up to help as you have helped us, forgive us, God. Lord, we call upon the Holy Spirit to come in our hearts and direct us on the path you need us to take today to follow you more closely. Lord, help us to understand fully the message of the cross, the message and that unending love that you have for us. Help us, Lord, to understand. Take the blinders off us. Fill our hearts and let us receive your word today because we are in need. We are sinners. We're in need of your grace and mercy. Lord, we call upon the blood of Jesus to strengthen us. We call upon the blood of Jesus to cleanse us and to make us whole and to give us restoration. Give us renewal of your Holy Spirit. Father God, we pray all these things. Forgive us for we know not what we do. Amen. Amen. that we share the bread and the cup is a culmination of this morning's sermon. This is God forgiving us and giving us such forgiveness and grace that he gives us this reminder. It's so around the night that Jesus was betrayed and took the bread and broke it, giving it to the disciples. He said, take, 
Later in the meal, when he took the cup, he filled it, blessing it, telling the disciples and those there that this is the cup of the new covenant. His blood shed for the sins of many, meaning all of us. Scripture reminds us that as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we are to do so until Christ's return. Ephesians 4, Paul writes, Therefore I am a prisoner for serving the Lord. Beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. Lord, today as we take this time to remember the great sacrifice that you made for our sins, we give you thanks. Lord Jesus, we remember your broken body and shed blood, not for anything that you did, but for us. It is by the bread and the cup that we repent and renew our commitment to you. Thank you for your sacrifice. It gives us eternal life through the forgiveness of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. <laughs> okay, well, this is really odd this morning, but it's good. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you're fine, you're fine. I usually bring my Bible up here and set it down with me, but... Um, I have an issue too. I have a herniated disc in my neck, and praise God, I got my um, notification this week that I can have surgery to get this healed. So I will have use of my hand someday, <laughs> my arm. <laughs> so praise God for that. Um, is there? This is time for prayers for the people. So <laughs> is there anybody else that would like prayer this morning? Uh, I thought it was pretty neat this week. We had uh, people ask for prayer, like Chloe, who was in the hospital, and. And Ethan was really sick, and we prayed for them. And as I had written them down in my prayer a couple days ago, they're all healed. <laughs> so praise God for that, and we'll just keep them in prayer this morning. So let's go to God in prayer. <clears throat> Father God, we come to you this morning to praise you and thank you for all things great and small, for life and breath each day that you let us walk on this earth, for days when we're happy or sad, joyful or full of sorrow, in pain or long-suffering, in plenty or in want. You supply all our needs, and you are the God that cares for us and loves us unconditionally. As it says in Isaiah 46, 4, even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he, I am he who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. Father God, we know that healing sometimes can be immediate or sometimes it takes a while, but we know in all things we should pray and trust you with our lives. Through prayer and petition, we call on you and your mighty power to get us through each trial in this life. For the devil roams around about to seek, kill, and destroy, but through prayer and your intervention and um, you take over our trials and you sustain us. You walk with us through the fire. You listen to all our fears, our joys, our hopes for the future. You bring us life abundant. You are a great and mighty God. Today we lift up Chloe to you as she has been in the hospital this week with asthma problems. And Father, we thank you for Chloe's life. We ask for the healing of her lungs. Please clear them from all viruses and remove the virus from her body. 
And we thank you that in Jesus' holy name. Father, we lift up Brianna and her baby to you, Lord. We praise you for new life that you have formed in the mother's womb. You have created this beautiful little girl. And we praise and honor you for them both in Jesus' name. Father, I lift up Sonia and her family to you. I met her this week and she asked for prayers for her daughter who has severe health issues. Father, you know her every need. I ask that you continue to meet her needs daily and heal her. Take the spirit of infirmity out of her body and let her feel the Holy Spirit at work within her to heal her. I ask this in Jesus' holy name. And we also ask for prayers for her and discernment for her husband so he, that he knows the purpose that you will and your will that you have ordained for his life. Father, we lift up Mark and Joe for healing of their knees. We ask you to wash their pain away with the blood of Jesus. Heal their limbs so that they may complete your purpose for you have for them. And that is your perfect will, Lord Jesus. Lord, we ask for constant care for our homeless and thank you for our shelters to be open and accept them all through this winter season. And we praise you always for our children and grandchildren. Please bless them and help them to find their way to you. And Father, help us all to be a people of prayer. For you are a righteous God and our Savior, and there is no other. You will rescue us, you will heal us, and you will give us all things in Jesus' name. Thank you, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. <coughs> I'm just going to stand for this one. <laughs> well, as we uh, close out our online portion of our service today, thank everyone for being here today. This week, I'd like you to start the Latin season up. Oh. I'd like you to start the Latin season up by uh, actually participating in the Lenten study, in this time of renewal, in this time of reflection, personal reflection. Take a good look at your heart and see where you actually stand with God during this time. And I ask you to go ahead and uh, self-sacrifice. And by that I mean reach out to those who have less than you Give them a hand up for the things that God has given you. Sell sacrifice and the things that you take and don't really need, whether it's binging TV shows or you know, being stuck on social media. But instead, take that time that you would normally use for those things and go back into reflection for God. Go back into your study. So the songs that I picked for today that um, I got to put in the list, so I'm really hoping Terry did. Uh, but I, I realized that this morning on the way here, and I went, oh, you know, you get those little flashes of, oh, I forgot to do this. Thank God for Terry. Literally, thank God for Terry. But listen, if you don't know the songs, you don't know all the words, listen to the message of the music today, and hopefully it'll speak to your heart. So God, we come before you today, and we we thank you for the inspirations that you give us. That out of tragedy and out of hatred, love shone through. The love of Christ on the cross, the love of God shone through his one and only son. Sacrificed for us so that we could come back into that right relationship with you, Father God. See, there is no peace on earth. And I was thinking about the Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, and he said, there is no peace on earth, for hate is strong, and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. So Lord, let us live against that during this season of Lent and on beyond it, and embrace that peace that you have in our hearts to share with one another. Thank you, Lord God, for hearing us today, for being with us always. In your precious and holy name I pray.
for those of you that are watching online that wondered why Mark said his own line, <laughs> Bruce, uh, who was a good friend of ours, messaged me this morning and he sent a meme. And it's empty because, you know, Mark's not. I, I'd hate to do that to him. It is Super Bowl Sunday. Yes, it is. Maybe next year, you know, we'll have to fill it with confetti. Yeah. <laughs> but hey, that's something that they do after a win. It's something we could have done after a great sermon this morning. So thank you, Mark. Yeah.